Hey guys, it's Trish from Mangtas. Don't miss great tech stories from our guests and our hosts, Jackie Nimink and Wato Delbare. Only here at Mangtas Nation. Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode unearthing remarkable and inspiring tech stories from today's star of the show. Now, our guest for today is a highly regarded customer experience consultant and the founding partner of Boag Works a design services company which leads businesses to success through effective UX strategies. Now, he speaks on various international events, writes for numerous publications, and has written six books about UX design. Now, without further ado, listeners, please help us welcome our guest for today, Mr. Paul Boag. Hi, Paul. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to be invited and um, great to to talk to you. All the way from Florida (laughs) on holiday. Yes. (laughs) At the moment, I'm at Florida. I'm very much a man without borders, although obviously from my accent, I'm I'm not native to Florida (laughs) and I don't even live here the whole time, but we happen to be here at the moment. Well, we're also very happy to have you with us today, Paul. And, you know, you're one of the most well-known UX leaders today. And we're very excited to talk with you about what you do and what you've created throughout your career. And I'm sure we're going to touch a lot of those points later. But before that, Paul, can uh, you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Okay. So, I mean, I've, I've worked in the field of, of user experience for my entire career, um, which is now, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, it's 27 years I've worked in, in user experience design. Um, uh, from the early CD-ROM days, I don't know whether you remember CD-ROMs. I expect some people here are just too young to remember such things. All the, the way floppiness. through... <laughs> Yeah, floppy disks. Yeah, yeah, that whole that whole phase. Um, so, and then I I got into the web very early, basically because no decent designers wanted to touch it because it was so boring and uh, you couldn't do anything. So it got given to me as a junior designer, um, and then I've worked in it ever since. And uh, I did the dot com boom and bust. Remember that as well. Um, and uh, was told I was going to be a millionaire, and then turned out that I wasn't. So so that was exciting. Um, Set up my own agency, worked uh, running an agency for for 13 years uh, in user experience design. Um, And then I left the agency to it. They're off doing their own thing still and and being very successful. Um, And I've spent the last six or so years consulting for a huge variety of organizations from government bodies through to startups, through to other agencies. Now I mentor um, agencies as well. Um, and then big e-commerce brands. So I do a lot of um, kind of work around improving the user experience with the aim of increasing conversion. So yeah, I'm a I'm a busy man. Well, I can I can just imagine now spanning 27 years, and you know, at the very beginning when UX still wasn't you know that well known, wasn't a what word. Were you interested? <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't even, exactly, it wasn't even a, a word yet. I mean, people were still grasping the in, the internet or the computer or MS-DOS. So what made you interested in UX design, Paul? Um, I would say that really, with that, I, I think a lot of it comes down to I'm interested in people. Um, more than I'm actually interested in in um, technology. I mean, technology is great; it's fascinating. I've you know always played it, I played with computers. I'm a you know total geek, but um, I really love the psychology of people. I really love 
why we do what we do, how ridiculously illogical we are when we use com uh, computers. You know, you've got this really logical thing that does exactly what you tell it to do in a computer. And then you have humans that where everything we do is interpreted and, and you know, and, and vague and, and emotional and, and weird. And when the two meet, it causes chaos and it's just brilliant. I love that. I love that moment where those two parts come together. So, yeah, it's it, it's about people and, and our psychology, and the way we think, all of that stuff. I just love, absolutely love it. And were you an artist uh, growing up? Um, so, so how did you even start with UX? Like, like how yeah. you take okay. some, some boring <laughs> industry, some very techy thing, and how do you start? approach it ux like you can now it's an yeah. end thing right as steve jobs comes along and everything is ux now yeah and yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. but before that it really wasn't right so you're you're way ahead of your time so how did you how, how come <laughs> luck. you approach luck. it that way it, it was luck. just luck i mean I, I i should be working in burger king now that's that's the reality right because the, you see the thing is it, 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 I was into art at school, but I but I I wasn't very good. The truth be told, I can't draw, I can't paint, but I've got a good eye for composition, color, that kind of thing. So so my my teacher at school said, you know, there's this thing called graphic design, right? Maybe that is of interest to you. So I got into graphic design. I went to university to study graphic design. This was before the web existed. Um, that's how old I am. I'm, you know, to any millennials listening. Um, uh, so, so I went to a university and while I was at university, I mean, absolute waste of time. Most of the people on my course were stoned most of the time, um, <laughs> as were our lecturers, to be fair. Um, so it, I was, and I, you hardly ever even bothered to go in. I had like six hours of lectures a week or something ridiculous. But I was in the studio one day um, and I saw a post-it note, no, an index card, you know, postcard, stuck up on the notice board. Just happened to catch it out of the corner of my eye that said IBM is recruiting for people to do a year's placement with um, with them do, working on their multimedia PC, um, which has a sound card and a CD-ROM, whatever one of those were. Um and so I thought, well, yeah, that, that would be good interview experience. So I applied to it and then I got it. And so then I'm working at IBM doing those kinds of bits and pieces, you know, on multimedia. So my first job was to design icons, 16 by 16 pixel icons with 16 colors. That was it. That was my design contribution. And then the team started to get asked, oh, do you, have you heard of this web thing? Do you, do you do you build websites? Could you build us a website? And of course, they looked at it a little bit, and it was grey backgrounds and centered text and no layout at the time, and they'd only just introduced the image tag. So, what do you do? You give it to the intern, don't you? Because no no self respecting person is going to touch that. That's how I got into UX. A really well considered career path there. That you grew into, <laughs> and yeah, you, you came because to it, love. Yeah, when I loved it, to be honest, I loved it from the beginning. I think I'm one of those people that are very much, um, uh, if you, <laughs> you could say it the polite way or the rude way, right? The polite way is I'm a polymath. I'm interested in everything. You know, I'm a renaissance man. Or you could say I'm a jack of all trades and master of none. Um uh, so basically, I like playing with technology. I like playing with design. And of course, the web was that perfect combination. You know, it, it's, it's both. So so as a result, it fitted me very well. I'm both a right and left handed brain person, if such a thing actually existed. And, and besides being fascinated by UX, do you find it hard? Mm. Yeah, even now. Even now, it's it's ridiculously, it's always challenging. You know, 27 years, and every time I do usability testing, I'm always surprised. You know, how is that possible? How, <laughs> you know, when you do something for nearly 30 years, how is it possible that you're still surprised by it? But I still am. People are weird. 
people do weird things. Um, and as long as people do weird things, I'm in a job. It's great. Um, and we're not, you know, we're not easy to classify. And it's so many, so many variables at, pa- uh, at play. Just take a, take a typical landing page, right? If you have a typical landing page, uh, and I was doing this this week, right? I'm designing a landing page for a, a pet insurance company. Um, and I designed up this page and it's got a picture of a dog and the dog is, is looking into the page. Right. Um, and, and, and I did it, did I tracking on it to make sure everybody was looking where we wanted them to look. And, you know, the gaze was going right around the page and all of these kinds of things. And the client said, uh, well, we always tend to have the, you know, the pet always looks into the camera is looking at you. Right. So I said, oh, it's fine. We'll, We'll pop in a different animal, popped in a different animal, animal, did my eye tracking again. Suddenly, everybody was looking in the wrong way, right? On the page, the gaze. And it's because people's eye line followed the eye line of the dog. So when the dog looks directly at you, everybody's attention now is grabbed by this dog looking at you, right? That's a classic example about how little things can completely throw off a design and how... There are so many of these kinds of things, slightly wrong color, slightly wrong size of an item. And suddenly attention is somewhere else. They don't see a key message and they don't convert, you know. So that's that's why I'm still surprised by it all. What is one of the I'm sure you've encountered many, but what comes to mind when it comes to something that really surprised you about the outcome? And then you said you you told yourself or you said to yourself well this this is exactly the reason why ux design is important oh easy this is an easy one so uh, i was working on an e-commerce website um and the this company sold frozen ready meals to elderly people right so that uh, and it wasn't it wasn't the actual old person that that ordered their meal right because um that these were really old people um 80 odd it was their kids that ordered but of course their kids were in the 60s right <laughs> so so an elderly audience that was buying these frozen ready meals for their elder, elderly relatives uh, and as we were going i was looking at the stats for the checkout process and noticing when it came to the payment page people were dropping out right they'd gone all the way through this process you know, selecting their products, putting them in the basket, all the rest of it. When they got to the the payment page, they were dropping out. And so I was looking at this page and, um, and I, 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 you know, you hypothesize, guess is the, the real answer. Um, you guess what's going wrong on this page. And I was looking at the VeriSign logo. I, know, I don't know whether you know what VeriSign is. You don't see them as much these days. But VeriSign logo, they're basically saying this is secure. You can buy from, from this site. And I was thinking, does anybody actually know what that means, right? I didn't design the original version. I don't think anyone knows what it means. We'll change it, right? We'll get strip that out. Perhaps people are worried about handing over their credit card number. Um, so I stripped it out uh, and I put in a padlock instead and a bit of text basically saying this site's as secure as your bank, right? That caused a 6% increase in sales overnight, right? Just that one little change. And I was like, yes, that's why this shit is important. Oh, no, I'm not supposed to use rude words, am I? Sorry about that. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. I'll just censor it. <laughs> yeah, just beat me. But then that'll make it sound like the word was ruder than it really was. So, so you know, I don't know. Okay. Was that part of the UX? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, that's a classic example. Actually, that is almost quite a good example of UX, about how we interpret things, right? That, you know, um, that you, you, we kind of have this, this way of filling in gaps um, in our knowledge. If we don't know something, we, we guess at it. So a, another good example, actually, of why UX is important was I was working on a, a university website and um, across, uh, what, we had different sections in the university, and one of those sections was alumni, right? Um, and we were testing with undergraduates, young people who'd never been to uh, university before. Um, and, and 
we were seeing if they could navigate around the site. And they kept going in the alumni section. And it was like, why are you going in alumni, you stupid idiot? Obviously, that's not for you. Obviously, I didn't call them a stupid idiot. Um, and, and so they kept going into the alumni section. And we had this time and time again. And in the end, I asked, what, why are you going into alumni? And the answer was, I didn't know what it meant and thought my stuff might be in there. Right. So because none of these undergraduates knew the word alumni, they thought it might apply to them. So that what I'm saying is if you beat my word out, then people won't know what the word is. And so they will make an assumption about what the word is that may well be wrong. There's the dodgy analogy between my... Now you have to leave my swearing in. This I, I made it impossible for you to edit that out. Good luck. This is becoming a very complex discussion with many layers. <laughs> now, with, with, all these, with all these examples, Paul, and I think uh, more for our non-techie uh, listeners, right? Um, and I think we, we know... I think people get an idea of what it's all about. But if you were to define UX, oh. how would you go about Oh, that's an awful question, because people have been arguing about this for as long as you could possibly imagine. Um, can I define it by what it can I define it in relationship to user interface design? Right. Because a lot of people um, kind of conflate the two. They you know, you see job descriptions all the time. UX slash UI designer. Um and user interface designers are are kind of interested in what's on the screen, what's in the interface, right? While a user experience designer is interested in the entire digital experience, okay? So a classic example of this, a little bit uh, something that I'm working on right now. So on a website, they've got it's a landing page website, and they've got a form that you have to fill in to start a, few, uh, a, a trial. And um, the form is really long because you know sales have got things they want to have on the form. Um, you know, marketing have got stuff they want to have on the form. To start this trial, you need to provide certain information for the the application to work, and and so it goes on, and the form has become long and bloated. Now, a user interface designer would make that form really easy to use okay um and good on them for that you know and it's a that and that's part of my job but i'm broader i'm more of a generalist the way that i solved that same problem is instead of just making that form easier to use i said well why don't we only grab at the core information to begin with and then follow up with an email and ask them for more information via email. And, and maybe when they sign up for, because they do face-to-face -face conversations with the sales team, we can ask them for more information there. So my definition of user experience design is, is it's what happens beyond the interface, right? It includes the interface, but it's also the stuff that goes around that as well. And for it, so, so think of it as UI is very narrow, UX is a bit broader now. CX, customer experience, is even broader because that takes into account things like offline touch points, you know, going into a shop or, you know, phoning up a telephone support line, that kind of thing. And, and, and I guess a lot of people will, will relate to this 100%. And, and, and I, I guess traditionally UX would be very two-dimensional because websites are very two-dimensional, at least to date, quite static, and maybe a little bit more dynamic now. But as we go into the 3D world and the metaverses and all of that, right? Um, what is your view? Uh, how, how important is UX moving forward versus the past? Or is it as important? Okay. First, I have to say we are a long way from the metaverse, right? Um, and the reason that we are a long way from the metaverse, despite what Mark Zuckerberg says, um, is that in day to day life, I mean, there are specialty, you know, if you talk about gaming, if you talk about, say, architecture, surgery, special use cases, and some of the, I mean, gaming is a big use case. Uh, you're not going to want to have your whole world blocked out from you most of the time. So, so in my opinion, at least, I think. Um, it, until we've got that mixed reality, augmented reality, working really well, which I don't think we're quite at yet. Um, I don't think, I think there's, you know, it's going to be a while before it takes off. And, and, and again, I think it's got to be very, um, 
non-invasive as well. So a big headset, people aren't going to wear that. It goes back to the psychology again. People don't want to look (laughs) like an idiot, (laughs) you know? And so it takes a long time before, um, you know, we think certain things are socially acceptable. I mean, look, you and me are sitting here with big ear, you know, I I look like, I don't know whether you've ever watched Doctor Who, I look just like a Cyberman right now. I wouldn't walk down the street wearing these, let alone, you know, a kind of full wrap round headset. Anyway, all of that is beside the point. Sorry, going off on a tangent. (laughs) Yes, it's going to be massively important. And because, again, it's humans interacting with technology. As soon as you get those two things mixing, um, there is a huge complexity involved in it. Um, I, to give you a really basic example, right? Do you remember the film Minority Report with Tom Cruise, right? And if you haven't seen it, he he's basically got these these three D environments um, that he's kind of grabbing and moving his arms around. I watched an interview of him talking about that, and he said it was exhausting, right? His arms got tired going like you know waving his arms around the whole time. And, and so there are practical considerations like that. It's all very well and good to say, you know, um, yeah, oh, it'd be great. It's much more natural in the way people were. Yeah, maybe if we were still cavemen and we were all fit, we're not now. We've we've slowly deteriorated into and evolved into these, you know, where we can barely move a finger on a mouse. So I, I think there is going to be a lot of adaption that goes on of, of well, OK, practically, how are we going to do this so that people are willing to adopt it? Um, because I, I think otherwise it could be a flash in the pan novelty that goes away. And there's a, there's a reason why I took that example. And, and, and this, this I found very fascinating. So uh, we have a virtual office set up. Yeah. Which is completely 2D. Yeah. Um, and somebody showed it to me. I was like, oh, my God, this is a 1990s game, Pac-Man style, whatever. Right. Yeah. And we came together there. I said, no, just follow me here. And literally within two seconds, my, I, my brain convinced me that I was in that office. And Excellent. And all the worst possible graphics. And that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, like it seems like the, it's, the UX of it was extremely good, while the user interface was super basic. Yeah. Um, back to I, the I, I, yes, and I think that there there is an element of that. I would. How long were you in there for a matter of interest? Uh, at that the very first time when you tried or, it, or, yeah, yeah, we, how, were, we were there the whole time. We were having a whole conversation. We had an hour and a half, um, and and I hour completely and a half. zoned and you, into that space, and and, and, and that I, was comfortable. I kind of, it was very comfortable, but it was it was basically. Because we were very used to like Zoom calls and all that. And all of a sudden, yeah. oh, wow, she was from the US. I'm from Singapore. It was if I, I was there in office with her. Yeah, I mean, I meant, basic. I meant uh, from the point of view of wearing a headset for an hour and a half. Was that OK? Oh, no, no, we were not. We were not wearing a headset. It was a ah, completely OK. 2D. It was a completely uh, 2D virtual office. Gotcha, so we were gotcha. just. Uh, we were just basically, you know, walking around in an office, almost game style, right? Right. Uh, so gotcha. it wasn't it wasn't with a with a whole device, but it was yeah. basically a more advanced, you know, space. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean I think it depends to some degree. What did it bring? What did it enable you? Who's interviewing who here? Um, uh, what did it enable you to do that you couldn't do in Zoom? I think the feeling of being together. The, I think when we are in Zoom, you know you are separated. When we come together in the office, if it's f- 10, 15 of us, and we're sitting next to each other in our little space, it's as if we're together there. You walk around right. and talk okay. to each other. And you can kind of walk to somebody's desk and talk to the person there. And it's kind of a, a simplified version of the real world, but just your brain goes into that space, although the graphics Ooh. are very basic. And, and we find it's actually really good for our culture, the way we collaborate, as opposed to forcing Zoom meetings where we know we are not sitting together. Uh, it's some, a very small hack. <laughs> yeah. And that's why I, I, I thought of bringing up that example because, wow, okay. I think, I think uh, when we go to the next levels of, I mean, I would call that a quote unquote metaverse to a limited extent. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, I was fascinated by the UX of it. So these guys intentionally did not push hard 
for for a three D experience. Yeah, I mean, I, the honest answer is I don't know, and and that's one of the things um, I think you learn. The longer you work in the U in UX, the less you actually know. At the moment, my gut is telling me that it probably, and I, yeah, I'm not convinced it will be the revolution that that Mark Zuckerberg thinks it'll be. Um, but then I've been wrong before. I'll probably be wrong. Well, I will be wrong again. You know, you just, you don't know until it happens. Um, and also I don't, I don't think you know until it happens what the problems are going to be, what the challenges are going to be, what the user experience issues are going to be. Um, you know, if, because I, I, let me give you an example. We, we introduced a tool, um, where, um, we had uh, when I was running my agency where, where basically it was like this, um, where you, you, you the, the software we're using to record this now, where you had lots of different screens open um, uh, uh, and you, lots of different people all uh, lined up on the screen. Um, and we could just chat with you, could click on a person and, and connect to them straight away. You seeing a live feed of them and ask them a question, replicating that real office environment. People hated it. They hated it because they didn't feel they could get up and walk away from their desk, right? Because they, you know, like they were being spied on the whole time. So people don't always respond the way that you think they will. Um, so, so far, I feel like the, the, the overarching message of this is I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know how people are going to respond. This is not, I'm not coming across as the expert, am I here? I need to yeah, try because harder. because people are so unpredictable too. They so, are. Which is... They are. Which is probably why, you know, you know, all this time. Isn't that the whole point, Paul? Isn't that the yeah. whole point that you don't know and that there's a method to figuring it out? Is that not the whole yes. point of UX? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it is. You're, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being facetious. Uh, I, I, and one of the things that when you work in UX, um, as long as I have, you start to, to notice what people are doing or even what you're doing. I surprise myself fairly regularly where I go, why did I do that? That's really interesting. I need to ma na make a note of that. You know, so, so yeah, it is very much that. It's, but you're right. It's the process. It's having a robust process to discover and understand what people are going to do in a very specific situation and how you can make it easy for them. And talking very about interesting. making uh, it first, easy. Yeah. Sorry, well, just mm -hmm. talking about making it easy, Paul, in your career, in uh, user experience, and I'm sure there are a lot of, you know, you have a lot of fan, fans that look, look up to you who, you know, have ambitions of being either UX designers or are already UX designers just wanting to learn from you. What are your favorite tools or the best tools that are available in the market for UX design? Wow, there's so many. Um, I, I actually wrote a blog post um, uh, rounding up a load of the ones that I use the most. Um, one of the, the one that I use the most, um, not that it's the best UX tool, but because it's such a great little sanity check, um, is a tool called Attention Insight. Is it Insights or Insight? I can't remember. Hang on a minute. Um, attention, oh, wrong browser. I've got too many browser windows open. See, this is what happens, isn't it? Uh, attention, there it is. It's attention insight singular, okay? Um, and, and it's the way to think of it is a spell checker for designers, right? Um, so it's not always right, but it's a useful guideline. And essentially what it's done is taken thousands of hours worth of eye tracking studies and applied machine learning to those studies in order to predict where people will look on a page. Right. And it predicts to about a 95 percent accuracy compared to a real eye tracking study. Um, and I it's not very expensive. I think it's like 90 dollars a month or something like that. Um, and, and essentially, I use that all the time. So whenever I do a landing page, I run it through there to see where people will look and, and what people will do, just as a quick sanity check. Um, so that's the tool that I use the most. Um, maybe the tool that I like the most um, for for the kind of work that we do 
is a tool called Maze. Um, uh, and Maze has got a whole suite of different usability testing tools um, for running usability sessions. But one of the things that I like about it, it does a facilitated and unfacilitated remote um, uh, testing. When it will, if you do unfacilitated, unfacilitated testing on it, it will provide you with statistics as well as the videos to the session. So it will tell you how long it took someone to complete tasks on average, you know, how many mistakes they made from the desired process, how long they, you know, spent on each individual page, that kind of thing. So you can, you can get some analytics out of it, which is really good. So that's a good tool. Um, then there's one of my favorite kind of analytic -y kind of tools is a free tool called Microsoft Clarity. Um, and Microsoft Clarity is, is like a free version of Hotjar right um i'm i'm very tight i don't like to pay money if i can get something for free um uh, so so microsoft clarity is absolutely brilliant so if you've been put off of getting hot jar check out microsoft clarity so it's got session recorders where you can watch people actually interacting with your site live um and naturally because they don't know that they're you know their session's been recorded necessarily um then there's things like it'll do things like give you heat maps of where people have clicked on the page and it gives you some some insights like for example rage clicks it'll let you know if someone's just lost their you know um let's swear word again uh you know and they're just kind of repeatedly clicking on the page um or things like misclicks where they're trying to click on something that's not clickable that kind of thing so yeah there, there's a few tools but there are so many more i'm a bit of a tool junkie if i'm honest <laughs> Well, we'll make I sure to a provide a link. To our CTO, MS Clarity. Go <laughs> ahead, let's check it out. <laughs> Matt, for me, MS, well, uh, uh, yeah, Microsoft Clarity is a, is a great balance to um, Google Analytics. I, don't get me wrong, I, Google Analytics is really, really powerful, but I'm not a, a stats geek, really. I, it, you know, you, you show me an Excel spreadsheet and my, I start dribbling out of the corner of my mouth and and lose consciousness um while microsoft clarity for me gives me more of the insights think of it like this google analytics is great for showing you where on your website you've got a problem right exits bounce rates that kind of stuff so you can find a problem page microsoft clarity will help you diagnose what is wrong on that exact page where it's going wrong on the page right now then for why it's going wrong right the why of it sometimes you can work that out from session recorders but that's typically when things like usability testing comes in um where you could get some qualitative data um from people and actually ask them what what you know what's going wrong uh, and then things like a b testing that's for fixing it right that's for okay let's try some different solutions and see what fixes it so you gotta have the right tool for the right job at the right stage Absolutely. Walter, did you have a question earlier that you wanted to yeah. ask? Yeah, I was going to ask about your books, Paul, because you, you mm. mentioned writing the blog um, and, and just just the titles alone reflect your personality, I think. <laughs> uh, really? Especially like the one, Encourage, encourage Clicks Without Shady Tricks. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe <laughs> I'd like to maybe hear a little bit about the inspiration behind it, why you wrote them uh, and what you're hoping to achieve with these books. Um, so I guess because I like the sound of my own voice is not a legitimate answer so I'll, I'll, I'll need to say something a bit better than that um, the, the honest Are truth audio books <laughs> <laughs> no they're not so that doesn't actually work does it no um, why do I so I've written six books now um, I, I'm a great, uh, as you can tell, I'm a great infuser. I, and, uh, you know, I love teaching this stuff. I love sharing this stuff. Um, and so I guess that's why I write. I, do you know, other than, let's be honest, you know, it helps with your profile and, and people are always impressed. Oh, you've written a book. I don't, I don't know why it's considered so impressive. It's really not that difficult to do. Anybody can do it. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so it's, 
yeah, I mean, I do it because it's good from a marketing point of view for my business and my services. Um, but I also do it just because I love sharing what I've, what I've learned. I always have done. And that's always been my my philosophy, really, is is yeah, I, I don't hold anything back. You know, I will share everything I know. And you'd think that in some ways that would be a dumb thing to do because surely people won't hire you if, if you just tell them how to do it themselves. But they do because people don't have the time or they lack the confidence or, you know, they, they just want someone else to do it for them. Um, so, I, you know, I've just always given away everything I know. It's been a part of me since 2005 when I started the first ever web design podcast. Um, and I started blogging and I've just given it away ever since. And every now and again, I become obsessed enough with a particular subject to write an entire book on it. <laughs> Amazing. And is there like a seventh book? Yeah, not at the moment. Um, I, I'm still, I, I'm one of those people, uh, you know, I've got the attention span of a goldfish. Um, you know, I, I go from subject to subject, you know, a certain thing grabs my attention and pulls me in and I become obsessed about it for I don't know, th two or three years. And then the next thing comes along. Um, and at the moment, the last book I wrote was Click, which was the encouraging, um, encouraging clicks, clicks about shady tricks shady one. Tricks. Yeah. And that wasn't the original title. It had a swear word in originally and my publisher banned me. Uh -huh. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I'm still kind of obsessed with that. I'm still obsessed with the, okay, how do you get people to act in a not ethical way? Because that sounds so pretentious when you say that, but in a way where they don't suffer from buyer's remorse afterwards, where they're happy with their purchase and they're excited by what they've done. That's that. And that, that is my current obsession and no, a new one hasn't come along yet. Perhaps I need to write a, a book on why the metaverse sucks. I don't know. <laughs> First try our virtual office and then decide. Okay. All right. All right. I know you're a convert. <laughs> no, so, so 27 years in the industry, um, you have seen it pretty much from the start till where we are sure. today. Yeah. Um, so, so how, what's the state, let's say 27 years ago versus 10 years versus now versus let's say five years from now. So how do you, how, how have you seen UX evolve as a practice, as a discipline adoption wise by businesses and individuals to where you think it's heading? Okay. So UX in particular, um, it's just getting better and better. I think company, I think the standards are being pushed up. Um, I think there is a realization that um, it's good for business. Uh, basically, there, there, there is a reoccurring trend that go, you know, that happens to any product from a user experience point of view over its lifetime, including the web. Um, to begin with, it's like the, the people that succeed are the, the people that get a product out to market. Simple as that. If they've got a product there, you succeed. Okay, that's because nobody else has done it yet. Then next, it becomes about features, right? Who's got the most gizmos and gadgets and extras on this thing, right? Then it becomes about usability, okay? And, and, and the user experience of it, right? As basically the product matures. So you could take any example, right? So take MP3 players, right? When they first came along, they were terrible. They held like three songs, you know, and and they were just and they, you know, you couldn't re, you couldn't skip a track or you know, have basic functionality was missing. But they they made it to market. Then it became a USB all about, stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, really, really basic stuff, right? Um, and then it became all about the features. It became about, you know, how many songs you could hold and, you know, what you could do with it and all the rest of it. Then you get Apple step into the ring. And Apple have done this time and time again, right? They step in the ring and go, right, now it's going to be about user experience. Now we're going to make this pleasurable, even if that means taking away some of those features. 
and and they did it with the phone. Phones went through exactly the same stages. Even even VCR, VCR recorders, video recorders, they went through the same stages. You know, first of all, they were just you know. Uh, you, wow, you can record TV. That's exciting. Then it was things like um, you had to enter a code and it would schedule when your TV was recorded, you know, and there was features like that that started to get added on. And then you got like, um, oh, I don't know what it would have been, you know, in other countries, but you basically have a, a sky box, which would, you know, record it. And there was a calendar and it became about user experience. And every product goes through this basic cycle. So when it comes to where we are with the web, we've now entered that user experience era. Um, and so, yeah, that that's where we're now. Where we'll be in five years, um, I think it, it will be it will be interesting to see. I'm not going to say because I don't know is the honest answer. I think it will be a continual refinement of where we're at. I think... To, the trouble is everybody's in different places, right? I work with some clients that are at the very beginning of their user experience journey, right? You know, really they've just got, they're at the feature stage, not at the, you know, experience stage. Other people have got very mature and, and uh, um, comprehensive user experience plans. So for those people in five years, I think we'll probably see a little bit of a leaner approach. Because I think at the moment, some people have got a little bit carried away. Oh, we need to run. Everything needs to pass through 12 user, you know, testing rounds and has to do this and that. And, and it's become so incredibly cumbersome and complex, their UX processes. That actually, I think it'll become a little bit leaner and a little bit more business focused over the next five years. Um, but they are already very digitally mature. Other people are going to be catching that up, you know, so it kind of depends where you are in the journey. So, so I find that what I find a little bit worrying still is that when we look for UX, people think design and yes. basically artistry. And, yes. and, and I think I feel it's still my personal take on this is still we're still very immature there because when people hear the word UX, by at nine out of ten people interpret it the wrong, on, uh, the incomplete way, very, the very, I would yeah. say, superficial artistry way, as opposed to the methodology and real user experience focus. And I'm hoping that in five years' time, when you say UX, people will actually kind of get, okay, we know what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the trouble is, it, it, it's, it, I live in a filter bubble. You know, because those kinds of people are not approaching me, you know, so so f I'm probably got an opinion that things are more advanced than maybe they actually are. Um, but, yeah, I mean, certainly I I remember experiencing that time, but I probably experienced that five years ago. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm not saying you're not right. You, you almost certainly are. I suspect I'm probably thinking things are a bit further along than they really are. And, and yeah, and, and uh, not so long ago, as part of an organization that had zero UX designers uh, and 200 developers, as an example. Yes, right. <laughs> I still come across. <laughs> no, I do. Yeah, yeah, I do still come across that quite often, and it mm -hmm. does. You know, it does vary. Uh, you know, you do get. You know, I get approached a lot by p people who are the lone UX designer in an organization and they just kind of come to me going, help. <laughs> um, and so I do spend a lot of my time helping them increase the visibility of UX design. Yeah, I don't think it varies hugely it, across across industries, across sectors, um, but things are getting better. That's the key. But for like for businesses, who you know are are either in your filter bubble or not paul how can they best like connect with you or if they're interested in in your works or like boag works for example where can they best find you or how can they best get in touch with you sure i mean you can you can uh, drop me an email at paul at boagworld.com b-o-a-g world.com um, but actually, uh, the thing, you know, if you're just interested in following some of the huge amounts of content I seem to spew into the world, um, your best bet is to go to boagworld.com, B-O-A-G, world.com. Um, and then the thing that 
I'm enjoying the most and probably putting the most effort into is my email newsletter these days. Um, there was time, blogging and podcasting has changed as there's been this kind of explosion of, of, of content there. And it's particularly blogging. You know, people don't subscribe to blogs like they used to. You know, we all used to read our RSS feeds. And so now every blog post you have to write, it feels like it's just got to be optimized for some search engine term or something like that. Well, and so that doesn't leave space to talk about the more abstract things, the things that maybe you don't think to search on. So that's why where my newsletter has become a lot of fun these days. I, you know, I'm really enjoying um, just sharing what's going on, what I'm thinking about, some of the challenges that my clients are facing, how we're solving those challenges and that kind of stuff. So that that's, um, I can't remember the URL for that. That's pretty rubbish, isn't it? Let me have a look. Um, I think it's just we'll forward slash We'll make sure to include it in the knows. show notes as well. Okay. All right. Well, that's, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. I'm sure. Oh, so forward slash subscribe if you're interested in that one. So um, they go to your blog and then there they can, I'm sure yeah, they but, can. Yeah, sorry, Boagworld, yeah, boagworld.com forward slash subscribe. To be honest, if you go to my blog and can't find the newsletter, then I've failed, haven't I, really, basically. And you probably <laughs> shouldn't be following me anyway, because I obviously don't know what I'm talking about. All right, there you have it, have it ladies and gentlemen, Paul Boag. Well, um, we're a bit pressed for time and uh, we extended a little bit. But Paul, thank you so much for Absolute pleasure. <laughs> being a guest on our show and um, for sharing your wisdom and uh, 27 years of experience with us. I wouldn't call it old. I would call it a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with mature. I like that, like a cheddar <laughs> or a wine. Okay. <laughs> Let's go with that too. Well, uh, thank you again, Paul. We've learned a lot from uh, this session with you and we're very honored to have you here. So uh, once again, I'm Jacqueline de Munk. And I'm Walter Delbare. And stay tuned and this for is the Mank next. Das Nation. Thank you for tuning in to Mangtas Nation. Mangtas, your curated marketplace for B2B outsourcing solutions. Follow our social media pages to know more about us. Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be a part of this global B2B marketplace. Join us at www.mangtas.com.